but I am very excited to be back and I'm excited to uh, to talk to y'all and to be here. It is a little early where I am, so I might be speaking a little quieter because there are some people still asleep in the in the building here. Um, I'm not in the Netherlands. I'm in Canada and it's like 6 a.m. So um, if I sound a little tired, that's why. Uh, I was just so excited to do this talk that I didn't want to reschedule or move it or anything. So um, I'm glad to be here. Um, we are going to shift over to the um, the presentation. Um, I'm going to give a talk about tools that I feel um, help with the creation of of games, uh, and specifically, um, I want to talk about tools that will help finding your idea, but also um, honing your idea, making it better, making it sharper, making it um, making it more complete or interesting. Now, um, before we feel like I should give a quick introduction. So um, let me know if this is up on the screen. I'm not quite sure how this interface works yet, but um, if it's there, that would be great. Can I also turn off on my camera at the same time? Is that a thing? Uh, I think that is a thing. Uh, yeah, I'm a little circle. Oh, that's cool. It looks like I'm looking at this through a fish lens, like, hello. Hi. Um, yeah, that works. Um, awesome. So, um, my name is uh, Rami Ismo. I'm going to be talking about taking your game idea to ideal game, and I'm going to be giving you six different tools for that. Um, for those of you who do not know who I am, um, I am Rami Ismail, as introduced before. Um, I am one of the co-founders of former game studio Vlambeer. I'm an industry uh, ambassador and an independent game development uh, developer. I've worked on tools such as Do Press Kit and events like uh, GameDev.World. Uh, I am also somebody who travels around the world, in normal years anyway, uh, to help developer, uh, developer communities around the world uh, get access to the tools and initiatives and opportunities that they otherwise might not have. Um, you might best know me from work at the three things I worked before, but I'm also involved in things like the Indie Mega Booth. Uh, I helped uh, set that up early on. I'm a partner at Indie Fund. And I collaborate frequently with things like the IGDA and other efforts around the industry to make sure that everybody gets their fair shot at game development, no matter who they are or where they are. So these are the six shapes I want to talk about today. And these are the six shapes that I think will be very helpful in um, honing your idea, improving your idea, and getting your idea to, um, to a better spot, to the best spot it can possibly be. And uh, some of these are tools that you might have seen in other places or in, in books or in theory books. I'm just going to go through them as if uh, they're all new for those who might not have seen them. Um, and some of them are my own. Some of them are just ways I think about uh, game design or uh, the creation of games. All of these are abstract exercises. So I'm going to need your, your attention. I'm going to need your... Um, I'm going to need you to visualize uh, with me as much as you can, um, because these will really help in uh, making making a good game, making the best game possible. Um, some of you have seen some of my talks, might recognize some of them as well, but we're going to go through all of them. Uh, some of these I've not really talked about before. So um, let's get started. So the first shape, this is a pretty common shape. Um, this one actually has two possible meanings, but the one that I really want to talk about right now is um, the idea of a basic human-computer interaction loop. And human-computer human interaction is actually a field that we all fall under as game developers, um, as game designers anyway, because what we're dealing with is a computer at the one end and a player at the other end. And what we are designing is what happens on the computer, but technically what we're designing is the space that happens between the computer and the player. So imagine, right, in the top right, um, right there being the player. And then the player feeds input into the game. So the top right is the player, then 
the player puts input into the game, then the input goes into the game, then the game processes that info, and then that info comes out in the form of feedback or output, which then goes back into the player, right? Um, that is the basic loop that we're all working with. And the beauty of that loop is that what we think is happening isn't always happening in the place where we expect it to be, right? Um, so, hmm, just checking if everybody can see the presentation real quick. Um, yeah, if there's a, yeah, there's, okay, I see a lot of thumbs up. I think we're good. I uh, just want to make sure that y'all are catching everything. I would hate for you to miss it. Okay, um, so again, in the in the top right, imagine the player. Then from there, we have input, game, output, and player. Now, the player's mind is where uh, a lot of what we do actually happens, right? And one of the things that is really useful to uh, to take with you is the idea of player intent, right? What the player is doing is formed by what the player knows, what the player is aware of. And how the player reacts to that is based on something we call the mental model, the model that the player has of what they're playing. And the mental model isn't a blank slate when they come into your game, right? When a player comes into your game, they take all their knowledge from similar games with them. They take all what everything they've seen in their marketing in the way you talk about the game gets brought into that mental model. And then based on that mental model, the player has certain expectations of how certain things might work or do work um, and certain expectations of how they want the game to work. So the game doesn't necessarily start when they boot up your game. The game might have started long before when they saw the first video of your talk or first trailer or the first marketing, or even when they played the first game in the same genre. Um, that's where the game actually starts for them when they boot up your game. And I find the easiest way to explain the mental model is actually when you boot up a game, you have a very specific mental model that is helpful. When you boot up a game, the first thing that happens is you see the logo of the company that made it, right? And now, if you are like me, and I mean no disrespect to any game developer whatsoever, I like to skip those. Uh, and I know from earlier games that I've played that I can skip those by hitting the escape button on my keyboard or a button on my controller. So I try pressing that button, which is input. The input gets processed by the game. The game decides whether I can skip or not. And then it outputs it continues with the logo or it hops to the main menu, right? Now, um, after it outputs, what it outputs goes back into my brain, right? So if it skips to the main menu, my brain registers, okay, right, if I press escape in this game, it skips to the main menu just like in every other game. Um, if it doesn't skip to the menu, my brain goes, okay, this game doesn't skip. Uh, when I press escape. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to press every other button on my keyboard to see if those work. And then after I'm done with that and it doesn't skip, my brain registers, okay, in this game, I cannot skip, right? Now that updates my mental model. And based on that update, I'm going to input again. So you have this really tight circle. And I hope you can see it now. My mental model says I want to skip this. I press a button to try and skip it. The game processes whether I can skip it. And then it outputs new information on the screen based on what it processed in the game, right? Then that information updates my intent and my mental model. And based on that, I might press other buttons or I might go to the kitchen to grab a drink while the logos go by, right? Um, now, this is happening 30 times a second, 60 times a second um, for, for the player. This happens all the time. But there are two things that are really important about this model. The first thing is that you realize that the game, the actual game, the real thing that is happening, is not happening where the game is. It's happening where the player's brain is, right? That's where the game happens. So you can't design your game for the game. You have to design it for the player, which means that a few cool things. The first thing is it doesn't really matter what the game is doing, right? 
It only matters what the player believes is happening, which means we can do a lot of amazing things. We can cheat. We can smoke a mirror. So we can take shortcuts. We can do anything. When you think about it, a lot of game spaces are basically boxes floating in space, but nobody would ever know it because when we create it to the player, all they see is what's happening in their mind. And this is where the most critical part happens when it comes to a game because it does not actually matter what happens in the game. What happens in the game is what you output back to the player into the player's head, right? And that means, for example, that uh, if in your game uh, you want to make a really good platformer, right? Normally the rule in the platformer is that if your character is standing on the ground, you hit the jump button, the character jumps, right? Um, but we want the player to feel good, right? We don't want the player to feel bad. So we're going to cheat for the player. So if a character runs off the ground, you know, they're, they're starting to fall. You might want to set a little timer for like five milliseconds, maybe a little longer, where they can still jump. Is that fair? No. Is that what the game should be doing? No. Does it matter? Well, yes, it matters because those five to 10 milliseconds will mean that the player will still make the jump that they thought they were going to make. Now you're good. When you roll dice in a game, right, um, if, if it feels good to roll a high number, you don't have to actually roll a dice every time. You can have bad luck protection for the player. If they roll really bad numbers a few times in a row, uh, roll a higher number or use fake random. Uh, use a normal distribution or a double normal distribution that is leaning towards the higher numbers uh, to make sure that the player rolls better numbers. Uh, like... Most games I know actually have a form of bad luck protection to make sure that the player always feels good because it doesn't actually matter what happens in the game. It matters what the player believes is happening in the game. And as long as they believe that random is happening, uh, it's random to them, right? And sure, there'll be somebody who walks, a, who writes a walkthrough or decompiles your game and finds out it's not actually random. Nobody will care about that. It turns out that people are actually really bad at, at pretty much everything related to math, uh, pretty much everything related to permutations. Uh, so if you ask somebody, you know, here's a boss fight, and there's a 10% chance that you'll get the drop after you beat the boss. How many times do you need to beat the boss to, to get the item, right? 10%. And a lot of people will say 10 times. Uh, but that's not how percentages work at all, right? Like you can you could technically fight the boss infinite times and never get the item because it's a 10% drop chance. A lot of games would just say, like, well, you know what? After 15 times, we're going to give you that item uh, because we don't want you to feel like you're being cheated by the game, even though technically the game is correct. This is also why feedback is critically important. When you are making a video game, focus on the things that matter most. Uh, focus on the things that are important uh, in communicating to the player, right? Um, just having your game function isn't good enough. Your game needs to communicate the important functions to the player. And you can find infinite talks about this. Um, the uh, Art of Screen Shake by my co-founder, my former co-founder, Jan Willem Nijman, is a very good one. Uh, Juice It or Lose It by Petri Purho and um, Martin Jonsson are, uh, is a very good talk about this. Um, and Lisa Brown gave a talk that is an addendum to um, the Art of Screen Shake that is really, really good as well. Um, all those talks uh, are recommendations when it comes to the, the art of feedback to the player and uh, focusing on what the game communicates back to the player because that is so much more important than what is happening in the game. And if you are designing, keep in mind that the part that really matters isn't the game it isn't there it is up there it is where the player is and if you're not if you're not focusing on that you're never going to make a good game now the second one that this is useful for us is this is a really good basic shape for iteration right when we're iterating when we're coming up with ideas you have a process and you should have a process right and this should be a very controlled process um a lot of people think of game ideas as like magical things that happen in people's brain and you know what a little bit of that is true, and we'll talk about that later. But what is absolutely true, uh, what is 100% true always, is that taking a process, an idea, to a game 
it's a process and the process needs to be intentional to get the best out of that so the basic process goes as followed at the top we have idea which is coming up with ideas right and then from idea what we're going to do is we're going to try and turn that into uh, a brainstorm uh, like a basic exercise where we generate ideas based on the idea then we prototype that and when we're prototyping, we're trying to make the hackiest, like just the worst version of it. Just It just needs to work, right? It can be on paper. It can be in code. It can be in Game Maker. It can be in Flash. It, can be, it, doesn't, it doesn't need to be production level. It doesn't need to be good. It doesn't need to look pretty. Honestly, it just needs to work. It can be squares and circles and nothing else. And in fact, most of our games, um, when we were at Flambeer, started like that. Um, really bad MS Paint drawings. And then from prototype, uh, we're going to go to validate, uh, which means that we're going to check. We're just going to check whether this does what we need it to do. Uh, and then whether based on whether we implement it or not implement it, we're going to go back to IDA. So now we're going to go, okay, so we've implemented this. This is where we are. This is where we were going to go. How are we going to get there? Now, the two tips I want to give for that process is at brainstorm, don't be too critical, right? You can bring any perspective into a brainstorm, but the two things that need to be true for a brainstorm is the first one, people need to feel safe. If you're working with a team, everybody working there needs to feel safe to come up with the worst ideas possible, right? And they need to not be told that it's a bad idea or, or that they're not smart or that we're not going to do that. No, every idea needs to go on the table, at least to discuss it, right? Because you never know what's in there. And the second thing about a brainstorm is that when you're done, when you're done with the brainstorm, when as many ideas are on the table as possible, then you can start cutting away ideas until you have the ones that you're gonna prototype, right? The ones that feel like they will fit best. Uh, the reality is that for a lot of things, you'll, you're gonna have to go through that cycle multiple times. For Nuclear Throne, which is uh, the last game that we released as Vlambeer, we actually started work on that game four or five times every time a roguelike with enemies that you had to defeat and then get to the exit. Uh, but the first four times we made it, players just ran by the enemies and they ran straight straight to the exit. And um, you know, Venom tried everything. He tried creating enemies that would block the player. He tried making enemies that were so strong that they were hard to avoid. He tried uh, all sorts of things. Uh, and we kept going through that loop, ideate, prototype, uh, brainstorm, prototype, validate. And every time at validate, we realized that we just didn't have it. Uh, people would run by the enemies or hide behind the corner until they saw an opening to run to the exit. Until I think the fifth time, JW come, came to me, my co-founder, and he said, like, what if, what if there is no door, right? What if the door appears when you beat the final enemy? And he had a prototype and it worked. And that was it. That was that was the solution. It took us probably years to figure that one out, even though every time we just kind of put the game away and made something else. But uh, sometimes the solution isn't where you think. And, you know, if we'd been brainstorming, like focused brainstorming, and we would have said, like, okay, how do we solve this? The door isn't there. Might have been a good solution to come up with. But sometimes the solution to your problem isn't where you think it is, which is why it's important to keep brainstorms open-minded. Do not shut down ideas uh, during a brainstorm and have good time for a brainstorm. Uh, don't make it a 10-minute thing. No, really sit down, spend an hour, spend like two hours just sitting there coming up with ideas for the same problem. And then eventually you might find you might find your door problem. You might find your solution, right? Your door, your, your portal to the next problem. Um, that loop keeps continuing, uh, and I'm going to, I'm going to add one more, um, one more fun note to this before I'm going to move on to the next one. Next one should be a little shorter than this. Um, one of my favorite terms in design, uh, that we, we sometimes used internally is plumbing, um, like a plumber, like Mario. Um, when you do design, often what you'll find is as you're going through this cycle, ideation, brainstorm, prototype, uh, validate, um, you will find occasionally that you've created a problem somewhere, right? And a good way to think about this is if we go back to the previous version of this, what are the design decisions that we're making doing to the player intent, right? How are they affecting what the player knows? And based on what the player knows, how are they affecting what the player tries to do? Um, 
And I think what really um, what really matters there is that you consider that sometimes when you're fixing design problems and when you're fixing the design of your game, that you might be creating new problems anywhere. In Super Crate Box, which was a really simple game about um, shooting enemies with random weapons that you found in crates, um, where every crate was a point, so you had to keep running across the level. Uh, one of the design problems we got into is that the point was not to kill enemies, right? The point was to get to crates, but we realized that that meant that people were just not shooting the enemies unless they really had to. And the solution we found, and we this was plumbing, um, was that we needed a mechanic that would make people shoot the enemies, right? Because that wasn't the point of the game. The point of the game was to collect these crates. Um, so what we ended up doing is we ended up making so that if an uh, enemy reached the bottom of the screen, they would come back from the top, but angry and twice as fast. Um, which meant that suddenly people had a reason to shoot the enemies again, right? Uh, that's plumbing. Like this is a design problem. We did not foresee that people would just not shoot the enemies. We kind of expected people to shoot enemies in a game with guns, but it turns out they don't do that unless they have to. We play tested it, and it just turned out not to be the case. Um, so based on that, we did some plumbing. We went back through the design and went like, okay, how can we still force player intent to be what we want it? Um, and in this case, it was by making the enemies go faster if they reach the bottom. So now you have a real incentive to make sure the players don't do that. So you have more time to grab your crates in peace. So keep these two in mind. Uh, you're designing always for the player's mental model, for what the player understands in the game. Uh, you're not designing for the game. There's no purpose in the game unless it is in a player's mind. Do not ever lose sight of that. Please do not ever lose sight of that. And always, always, always try to be honest to yourself in what the player knows at any given point. Do not tell yourself, oh, the player will figure that out or the player will know that. If you have to say things like the player will, test it, play test it. Have somebody sit down who knows nothing about the game and watch them play, right? Um, but if you're, not doing, if you're not doing that, if you're still in the abstract uh, part of coming up with a game idea, Please focus on what does the player know, or what will the player want to do, and how will the player do it based on what we've told them. And if you keep these questions in mind, uh, you'll have a much better shot at figuring out your, your game design. Now for the second shape, um, the second shape is much easier. And it is a shape that I use a lot. Um, when I'm uh, brainstorming or when I'm thinking about games, um, what I will very frequently do is I will just draw a straight line on a piece of paper or mentally in my head, right? And I will use that line to separate things. And the two things I tend to separate most frequently are verbs and nouns. Verbs being player actions, things the player can do, affordances they have, um, activities they can undertake, buttons they can press uh, with the results. And at the bottom, the nouns, the things that the player does those actions to, the, um, the tools that they use for that, the uh, effects that those might have, um, the enemies they might encounter, the worlds they might be in. And it turns out that that is actually very helpful to me. Uh, it is very helpful to me to sort of separate out what the player is actually doing versus what the player uh, is doing it to or where the player is doing that. Uh, this sounds like a very simple thing, but it turns out that for a lot of people, that distinction is relatively big, right? And the reality is for how you make things in a game, it's not. Usually the things under the line are content. They're things that you can produce with um, a content, um, with a content team, uh, artists, designers, uh, musicians. Um, the top part are usually very structural. Right, they're very integral to what the player is doing and how the player does that. You can change the context of a game pretty severely without um, without impacting the game in super meaningful ways. Well, you cannot change the verbs uh, or many of the verbs without making a fundamentally different game. One way. Um, one way to remember uh, how much impact this has is to say, 
Well, imagine, um, I used to use the example of a castle in the sky, right? A castle in the clouds. And in the castle, there is a warrior um, with a sword uh, fighting a dragon, right? And now, in your mind, uh, a lot of this scene can be constructed. Your brain is actually really good at that. It'll just make up uh, clouds. And you might imagine blue skies, white clouds, you know, ancient uh, medieval European style castle with gray stones, um, probably a knight, right? Because they have a sword, uh, but maybe your imagination is cooler than mine and you came up with like a jetpack astronaut. Uh, and a dragon. Uh, I don't know. What color is the dragon in your head? Is the dragon red or blue or green or gold? I don't know. Um, your brain fills in all these details uh, pretty easily, right? And if I tell you to change them, um, that's pretty easy as well. And you can actually imagine that in the process of game development uh, being, you know, unpleasant uh, to have to change uh, the texture of the thing you're you're fighting or the place you're fighting. Um but doable. But if I say, okay, take out fight, the scene completely changes, right? Uh, if you say, like, okay, instead of fight, it is going to be um, avoid or run away from. Uh, if you if you take that in your process of how to develop this game, now you're making something else entirely, right? Um, so making that distinction really helps. Th keep in mind that computers are really not smart. Right, our brains are very are very good at imagining stuff. A computer is not. If you say castle, computer is just going to go like, "What's a castle?" And unless you make it, there's no castle. Um, that was random, but I think it's important. Like our brains work very different than computers. The second thing this is very useful for, I find, is I get overwhelmed easily with ideas. Right, like when you give me, you tell me, okay, you want to make him a game. And it can be anything you want. Um, that's too much. Too, it's too much. There's too many ideas you could make, right? So the other way I use the line is I imagine drawing the line across an entire piece of paper, separating the paper in two. And that is choices. That is how choices work. When you start with every possibility, you need to create constraints. You need to draw a little box for yourself or your games. In a Vlambeer, we had a rule that every button you press needed to have a reason to unpress it, to let it go. That was just a basic rule of Lambier. Um, and uh, that was a line across the paper, right? All the games that didn't do that, all the buttons that didn't have that, we could not implement. Uh, so that entire piece of the paper was gone. And then we were making arcade games. So the piece we had left, we drew another line. Okay, so arcade games. Okay, we'd like to make games that were about like say 10 to 20 minutes play time okay so all these ideas are gone and now we only have this space left and then um we wanted to make games that could work on pc and console so now these ideas were gone and um every time every time you make a choice you make the space smaller but that is actually a good thing you want to make the space for your ideas small so you can focus on those so in your studio in your game Try to think about the way that you've cut the paper into smaller and smaller parts until you got to like a nugget, like a core, something at the heart of your game that is true and that is important. Now this model um, helps with that. So when you come up with a game idea, um, the important thing is that you have something at the heart of it, at the very center, at the, at the heart of your game, that's called the core, right? And the core, or some designers call it the nugget, uh, some designers call it the heart, um, but it is usually a sentence, half a sentence even, that explains what the game is in terms of experience, right? And very often that is not the same as your pitch, right? Your pitch is how it faces consumers. This is what it truly is, ridiculous fishing was a game about fishing with machine guns that we made. But at the heart of it, we just wanted this to be a very chill, positive game um, that makes people laugh, right? Um, and at the heart was this idea that the game would be a positive feedback loop, 
no matter what you did, you would get a little reward or you would make a little progress or you would feel like you've made gains, you've made forward momentum towards your next goal. And I think the best way that's exemplified is if you download the game and you install it and you start playing, the first time you play, you could literally just be pressing the phone against your screen like this and still do well enough to buy the first upgrade in the game. It is almost impossible um, to not be able to buy the first upgrade after the first round. We just wanted that to be true. And we wanted that to be true for the entire game, that if you played well, sure, you would progress fast. But if you played poorly, you would still progress. It would always be good. Ridiculous fishing would always feel like you were moving forward. That was the core of the game. Had nothing to do with fishing. Had nothing to do with guns. Had nothing to do with explosions. Um, at the core of our game was the game should be a chill, fun game, right? Um, a game that holds the player and just kind of like pushes them towards a shiny thing every time they play. Now the second layer of that circle, right? So imagine your game. Imagine in the first circle, in that center circle, you write the core of your game. What is the heart of your game? What is the feeling that you want the player to have? What is um, what is the experience that you're trying to give people? Um, then that second circle, right? That's your mechanics. So what are the activities, the verbs from the previous slide um, that the player has that affects those, right? And now here's the important thing. Any mechanic that you write in that second circle, you need to be able to put a dot in them and draw an arrow back to the to the core. You need to be able to justify how that mechanic supports the core of your game. Now, there's one exception. Sometimes when we do plumbing, right, design plumbing, it might be that a mechanic points at another mechanic, which is fine. That's also okay. It might be that this mechanic supports that mechanic, and that mechanic points back at the core. That's entirely fine. You don't want to do that too much because the game becomes inelegant. But you do want to make sure that whatever mechanic is in there, it generally points back at the core of your game. Um, when you think about things that way, you start thinking about how things support the player intent, right? the player experience from the first shape. And it also helps you think about verbs and nouns as separate as separate things, because the mechanics are verbs, they're affordances, they're things that the player can do more than things the player sees or hears or uh, feels, right? Now your third circle is um, your aesthetic, your, your feedback, your output. It is everything the player experiences, sees, um, call it feedback for now. Everything your player experiences, feels, sees, hears coming back from the game. Now, all of these things, if you're thinking about the first model again, the first thing that we talked about, um, should be focused on communicating the important stuff to the player. You don't actually have to communicate everything your game is doing. You don't always have to communicate um, every change in the game back to the player. No, you only have to communicate what is important to the player. So, yeah, sure, I'm sure... There's thousands of variables updating in your game uh, frequently. But if there's only five that are relevant to player intent, then those are the five we're going to be communicating back to the player. So in the feedback, you're going to put everything that feeds back to the player um, and how it feeds back. This can be how the world looks, what the setting is in, um, the effects, the VFX, the SFX, um, the way the character looks, um, the way you can customize your character, all of these are visual, auditory, haptic uh, ways of feedback to the player, right? Um, those, the same way, need to be able to point back at a mechanic, at another aesthetic or feedback, another piece of feedback, or back to the core directly, right? And if they point the wrong way, if they're pointing away from your core, they need to get rid of them. Um, the simple the simple fact is, if something is pointing away from the core, if it's contradictory to the core of your game, it probably should not be there. There's always exceptions. Every rule has an exception. But uh, a Nuclear Throne was a game about going fast, right? We want a player to have momentum, and we had a character that had slow motion. 
And we realized that that was pointing away from the core. Slow motion is opposite to going fast. So we changed that character. Instead of slow motion, um, she could now throw her weapons at enemies, which means that you suddenly didn't have a weapon anymore. You had to run after it to grab it again, which was way better for going fast. Now, the final circle around it is meta. It's your main menu, it's your marketing, it's uh, a lot of the stuff that isn't directly related to the game, but is still attached to the game. Um, the same applies for that, that needs to point back at your aesthetics, at your mechanics, or at your core. Uh, do this exercise for a game. Try to think, try to be honest about where everything is pointing. Is it pointing towards the center, or at least not away from the center? Then it's good. If it's pointing away from the center, think about why you have that in your game. What is the reason uh, for having that? Because it might be a better game if you did not have that. Now, um, for the next model, uh, I'm thinking I'm running out of time a little, so we're going to go a little faster. Um, this one is pretty. This one is pretty popular. It's pretty common. Um, there are two things uh, that you can think about this one. The first one is the the Dunning Kruger curve, which basically says that um, if you are new to something, you will think you are better at it than you actually are. Um, it commonly um, means that if you are not an expert in something, you should let the experts figure stuff out. That doesn't mean that you shouldn't have an opinion or shouldn't inject your opinion. It's just that you should recognize that experts are experts for a reason. Um, my favorite example is playing guitar, where everybody who picks up a guitar uh, will spend a day learning a Oasis song um, or something, and then uh, think that they're the best guitarist in the world and that they can learn any song in the world as long as they you know, follow a YouTube tutorial. And then the reality is that playing a guitar properly is actually really hard and can take a lifetime of practice uh, to, to get your own style going, to play a song well. And the same is true for everything in video games, honestly, uh, for design, for art, for programming. Um, these are hard things and they take experience, they take time, they take practice to get good at them. I was honestly a terrible game designer uh, for most of my life, and thanks to Jan Willem, my co-founder, uh, I realized that the way I was going through my process was all wrong. Uh, Jan Willem was really quick at prototyping, uh, really threw ideas against the wall, and this just kind of saw what stick. Um, and I would make these big, complex game ideas. I would have the entire world of it. I would have the characters. I would see exactly how they would move and how they would behave. Uh, and I would never prototype anything. And then when I would start prototyping, I'd realize, oh, that actually doesn't work. Or, oh, that's actually too big a space. Or, mm, that mm, no, players don't do that. Uh, and I would never be able to make the ideas I had in my head. So about um, eight or, yeah, about eight years ago now, I started making very small games on the side outside of Lambeer uh, just to practice, uh, just to be better at design. Because when I was starting as a game designer, I always made... Um, the games I worked on took a year, year and a half to develop, and I was actually mostly involved in, in programming. I was always a programmer. And I realized that my programmer brain really wants structure. I want to create the full structure of a thing before I start working on it, because that's how you do code. Um, but as a designer, that's not how it works. You solve small problems uh, one at a time, and those small problems turn into a building, right? They're, it's more like making bricks, and you need to make sure that the bottom bricks are sturdy, they're strong, that they're good foundations, that they're big, uh, so that you can put many smaller bricks on them. And you need to test. You need to test whether your building is still stable. Um, and then when I started seeing that, I realized that programming actually isn't all that different. Like, you do the same thing, but we just come up with the full structure, and then we start typing, and we're like, oh, that's buggy. Uh, oh, that should probably not be in this class. Uh, this should probably move from here. Um, and we're still testing. A good programmer is still compiling the code frequently, right? Like, checking out whether they introduced any problems. Um, but uh, it taught me to not try to make the code perfect. It taught me to try and do it fast. I'm... By trade, I'm more of a C programmer, but I love Game Maker nowadays for prototyping because it's just really, really fast. Um, so now when you're thinking about 
um, when you think about game design, uh, especially game design, because that's the topic of this talk, uh, realize that game design is difficult. It is not just something you, you do. You can't just sit at the table and be like, I'm, I'm designing a game now. I mean, you are, absolutely. Um, but if there are people that are good at design, the way they're going about this is probably a very different way for uh, a very different perspective than, oh, that will be cool, or wouldn't that be interesting? Um, that doesn't mean especially at a brainstorm, that doesn't mean don't mention your ideas. We need your ideas to design games, right? Even if you're a programmer, even if you're a musician, uh, because we need perspective on the idea. Uh, but it does mean that when decisions get made, uh, please respect that those decisions probably get made for a reason. Uh, and as a designer, please understand that your responsibility to your team is to make sure they understand why you chose certain things and that you can communicate to your team why a certain decision was made. The second, uh, the second thing that is important here is a flow theory, which you might know from uh, Mihaly Csikszentmihalyi. Um, flow theory is a pretty common concept. Uh, if you haven't heard of it, the basic idea is if on the one axis you put the player skill, and on the other axis you put the player challenge. Um, so how much, how good the player is at the game versus how challenging the game is. That diagonal line is probably the ideal, um, which is as the player gets better at the game, the player gets uh, the game gets harder on the player. Um, that doesn't mean that every game should look that way. Uh, most games actually adhere to sort of like a curve where the game starts kind of soft, then ramps up pretty, uh, starts kind of soft, ramps up pretty uh, strongly for a bit, and then sort of like levels out and then continues a bit steeper. Um, which is um, which is a helpful model, right? The, the, it's a good way to go about it. But there are games that go very differently. There are games that basically start very steep and then you stay on that level. Um, but you will find that a lot of the games that we think of as hard uh, are not actually hard. Um, games like Demon Souls or Dark Souls are actually very forgiven on the flowchart. Um, all they do is they start a little steep, but then from that point on, they actually continue pretty pretty diagonal. It just goes like, whoop, and then it goes, okay, well, now we're, we're diagonal again. It starts a little higher, um, a little faster than most games, but then it's very controlled about our, its difficulty curve with an occasional spike here and there. I'm not sure if those are intentional or not, um, but... Hard games don't necessarily mean that they're always at the at the top. You will find that the best hard games in the world, uh, the best difficult games that you'll ever come across, are actually games that are very, very controlled about that specific chart. And games that are casual, uh, games that are meant to be the most accessible, usually, same thing, they just start a little less steep, but they usually catch up pretty fast to the, to the sort of perfect flow, to the sort of normal challenge, because what they want to do is they want to ease players in to the challenge and then go from there, right? So it doesn't necessarily mean, this chart doesn't mean that you always have to be on the perfect diagonal. It does mean that if you stay too low too long, people will get bored. And if you go too high too fast, most people will get frustrated. Um, those are not wrong things, but they are things to think about when you're designing your game. Only way to know this, is to play test. So same as always, play test, play test, play test. For all of these models, same thing is true. Good game designers, good game developers, they are play testing from the very early parts of a game. I play test a lot of games, and a lot of the games I play test for my friends, for other companies, uh, look like squares and cubes and triangles. They're small prototypes, and people are already testing to see whether that works. Now, for the next one. This is the, um, somebody in chat is already saying, somebody in the audience is already saying it, but this is the MDA framework, which is uh, mechanics, dynamics, aesthetics. Um, this is a framework that I personally don't use a lot, but I have found that it is very helpful for people um, with specific attitudes to games to understand some of the earlier models we're talking about, right? Um, the MDA framework is a way of thinking about that human-computer interaction loop from a less technical and a more emotional point of view. 
And when we're thinking about it, what we are doing as game designers is always on that edge, right? Like we're always on the edge of so many things. We're on the edge of art and commerce. We're on the edge of art and business. We're on the edge of technology and emotion. We're on the edge of um, of technology and art. Um, the MDA is really helpful in um, seeing how a player and a developer approach games from different angles. And this is important because I think a lot of developers forget at times that they are game developers and that the way we look at games is not necessarily the, play, the way the player looks at games, right? When the player is looking at a game, they don't have any idea of what's happening behind the curtains. That's hidden to them. When you play a game as a game designer, as a game creator, you might stop and think, wow, how did they do that? Or how did they make me go that way? Or how did they make me press that button? How is this UI built? What is the texture? Uh, what is this texture? Why does this billboarding look so good, right? When I play Halo with my friends, they get annoyed at me because I stop when there's a scene transition and it's just so smooth. And I didn't realize there was a load point. I didn't realize there was a trigger. And I'm just, I just stop. I just, I'm like, wait, wait, give me one second. Let me go back. I want to like, let me just look at the, the cave we're just in. I just want to one second. And they go like, Ram, we want to, we want to beat the boss. Like it's, he's right there. Like, can we, can we shoot him? I'm like, no, 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 no. Give me just up one second. And so my friends don't play um, Halo with me that much anymore. Um but the, like you, as a developer, what I'm trying to say is as a developer, you bring a developer's mindset to video games, right? Now, the MDA kind of pulls back to some of the earlier models we're talking to, right? You've got your mechanics, right? Those are the things um, the player does, right? Those are the, the things that the player um, does in the game. Now, your mechanics uh, are rules, right? They are the rules that you put in the game. They're the rules that you program into the game. They are like written down. Imagine a book in which you write these rules down. They're not actually the things the player does, right? They're just the rules of your game. If you press forward, character moves forward, right? If you press space, the character jumps. If the character has a negative speed, a uh, negative V speed, a downwards vertical uh, movement, and you touch an enemy, the enemy dies. If your character has an upwards vertical movement, um, then uh, your character uh, takes damage, right? And Mario rules, basic rules. Um, now your dynamics are what happens to those rules when the game is being run. Uh, they are the things that the player does because of those rules, right? The behavior that the player portrays because of that rule. Uh, when we go back to the human computer interaction model, um, your rules are in um, your rules are in the game, right? And the dynamics are in the player, right? Um, so the rules get output to the player. The player updates their mental model, and that mental model uh, decides what the input is going to be. Those are your dynamics on that side, the player and the input. That's where your dynamics are happening. Um, this is a really helpful way. Of looking at the um, at the problem of game design, right? Like the problem of game design is you create these abstract rules that are implemented, that are created, and then you have to test them against the player, and that creates a certain dynamic. That dynamic then creates an aesthetic, and the thing with aesthetic, when I say aesthetic, I don't mean like an art style, and I don't mean like the way the game looks. No, I mean like an experience the player might have. If you look up the MDA framework, uh, the creators created. Um, a nice list of what these aesthetics could be, but they can be a challenge, a sense of, of mastery, a sense of exploration, a social uh, uh, aesthetic, an aesthetic of playing together, uh, which is really popular right now, right? Among us, Fall Guys uh, are games that operate a, across a social dynamic, mostly. Now, these aesthetics are the experience that we create in the player. Now, if you take that model, you notice the little pot, uh, arrows uh, between them. There's one line of arrows going to the right, and there's one line of arrows going to the left. Um, imagine that as the developer, you are next to where mechanics is. So you are looking all the way from mechanics through dynamics to aesthetics, right? So when we are making a game, 
where we're coming from is we're trying to create these mechanics that then establish a dynamic that then affect the uh, aesthetic of the player. Where the player is, is on the other end. The player first has the aesthetic, the feeling that the game generates. Then the aesthetic um, leads to dynamics, right? Because they understand this is a game about mastery, so they play the rules in a certain way. Uh, and then that is confirmed or allowed by the mechanics. They're looking at this from the total opposite direction of this framework. Um, when you keep that in mind, again, um, the circle model that we talked about before, um, the uh, difficulty model that we talked about before, and the human-computer interaction model that we talked about before, uh, all have a different dimension when you're looking at it from this view, when you're looking at it from the player is trying to achieve a certain aesthetic, a certain feeling, a certain experience, and they're going through this model from the opposite direction. Super critical to keep in mind uh, when you're doing play testing, when you're looking at your work, when you're uh, verifying certain ideas that you have, is that somewhere in your brain, you keep thinking about this. The player does not see the game the way you see. And this model, a really good way of keeping that in mind. Now, for the final one, I want to go a little less technical. And we're going to bring this back a little. Um, because uh, when I when I talked about uh, at the start, I said we'll talk about this a little later. Uh, this is what I want to talk about: is that ideas are only possible in a mind that has space for them, right? And um, with space, I mean it has influences, uh, it has uh, comp, it has uh, safety for this, which means that game design in a large part is about being good to yourself as well. It's about having the room uh, to come up with ideas. It's about having the safety to come up with ideas. And it's about having the inspiration to come up with ideas. And inspiration is one of those words that all of us use as if it's magic, right? As if it's just this thing that happens. And uh, I was just taking a shower or I was uh, watching TV and suddenly this idea hit me. But the reality is that's not how it works, right? The reality of inspiration is that you create it. And I don't mean you can just sit down and have inspiration. No, no, no. That's not how our brain works. Our brain does work in mysterious ways, right? Um, but what I mean is that inspiration comes from knowledge. Inspiration comes from experience. Inspiration happens in a brain that has the touchstones to come up with ideas, right? And that means every time you read a book, or every movie you watch, every concert you go to, every song you listen to, every time you travel, every time you go somewhere, every dinner that you've had, every meal that you've made, um, everything that you've done in your life is what inspiration is. And when people say, well, it's hard to come up with game ideas, that might be true. Our brain might be blocked, right? Our brain might be stuck. Our might, brain might have too high expectations of what, uh, the game idea should be. But our brain is always generating. Our brain is always thinking. It's always doing silly stuff. It's putting two things together that shouldn't go together, right? When people say everything is a remix, they don't mean everything is A plus B. That's not what it means. It doesn't mean like everything is Mario Kart with dubstep. Like that's that's not how it, that's a terrible idea. Not everything, <laughs> actually, uh -uh. Um, not everything is, a plus B smashed together. No, no, no. What they mean is everything is a mix of everything you know, right? You can't create ideas about things you don't know. That's just not how it works. So people ask me, how do I become a better game designer? I say, go skydiving. And it's, I don't mean like actually go skydiving. I mean, go do something that you've never done before. Um, go make space in your brain for new game ideas. But the most important thing I mean is don't just get your ideas from games. Every game idea Flabria has made has come from somewhere else. It has never been just games. And yeah, sure, absolutely. Games are a huge part of what I do, right? I play games all the time. There's a PlayStation back there that I took on a trip across the world so I can play Destiny, so I can play Fuser, so I can play Bug Snacks, um, so I can play the Falconeer, so I can play all the games. I have like over 100 games on this phone right here. Um, that's also like, it's great. Like play video games, be aware of the tricks people are using, be aware of the technical craft people are using. But um, Ridiculous Fishing came from a documentary, right? 
uh, Nuclear Throne came from uh, science fiction, uh, 70s science fiction. Uh, Luftraumsters was actually a technical test. We wanted to see if you have two sprites, if you rotate this one, if you scale it and you rotate this, uh, can you make it feel like a 3D airplane? Uh, and it turns out, yeah, that's that, that's possible. So then we had an airplane, and now we have to make an airplane game. Um, a lot of game ideas happen, and it feels like magic. But really what happened is your brain took all of the everything you know and just configured it into an interesting way. And the only thing that helps with inspiration, the only thing that really matters with inspiration is that when it happens, you write it down. Even if it's a bad idea, sometimes I'm asleep and I wake up and I have an idea and I have a notepad and I just I just write it down. And then I wake up in the morning and it just says something like the dog jumps on the car. And I'm like, what does this what? Why is a dog jumping on a car? And I just I have no idea what it means or why or like what happened. Um, and then I just throw the note away. Uh, but sometimes there's something there and I'm like, oh, OK. Yeah, sure. Um, that, sounds, that sounds good. And then I work with that, right? Sometimes my brain solves programming problems while I'm asleep and I wake up and I'm like, I know what to do. Um, but if you let those fleeting moments go, if you don't treat them seriously, it won't work, right? So you have to treat those moments seriously. You have to treat every idea as if it's golden. Just treat every idea that you have as if it's the best idea ever. Write it down. Have respect for it. Because that teaches your brain to be more aware of when that happens. And that part of the process is actually very helpful because your brain is constantly generating. Now, the reason the shape is what it is is because it, this, this shape is a funnel, right? The more is at the top, the more can go down in the funnel. But the end point of any inspiration, of any idea, is that you get to a point, one point. And that point goes in the model above it. It goes at the heart goes in the core. Now, from there, you build a game. You build a game by keeping in mind that you want to minimize the space. You want to have that line, that vertical line. You want to make constraints that allow that funnel to get smaller and smaller, right? Until eventually, you're at one point. And when you're at that point and you're thinking of your mechanics, keep in mind that loop, that loop that we talked about at the start, how players interact with the player, the input, the game, the output, right? And then after you've created that and now you're working on your content, keep in mind the, the accessibility, the difficulty, the, the, the challenge, the growth of your game. And then while you're making all of this, keep in mind that the player doesn't look at the game the way you do. And in the end, when we're designing games, that's what matters. It's not the game that's on the computer. It's not the game that's on the phone. The only game that matters, that will ever matter, is the game that happens in the player. So that was my introduction to game design. I hope this was helpful. Uh, if there are any questions, I think we're going to do a quick Q&A. I don't know how much time we have. But um, thank you so much for being here. And thank you so much for this, uh, for being a lovely audience. I see all your little thumbs up. Uh, I appreciate it a lot. Uh, that is the end of the slideshow. So I'm going to stop. Face back. Oh, my god. It's my face back. Um, and then I think there is a QA. and uh, a Team, do I have time for a few questions? You have plenty of time, awesome. Rami. So let me let me start marking the questions people have asked for. Okay. As you have questions, put them in Q&A, please. So we can just go from, um, I think, some of the, let's look at some of the earlier questions. So I'm going to pick them. Uh, Rami, if you just look at your Q&A section, you'll start seeing questions come out Great. to you. Is that happening? Uh, yep. This one is from uh, Shiraz. So I think you've got that one. Uh, yep. Um, sure. Could you give me an idea of how complex it was to realize the design to the end concept? What are the things you had to cut out? What's one of the most important things you learned from it? So every game you make um, is going to involve cutting. Right. Uh, every idea you have is going to involve cutting the the funnel, the the arrow that looks like this with a point at the bottom, uh, effectively is continuously cutting, um, cutting stuff. And I think a game is at its best not when you can't add anymore, but when you can't cut anymore. 
Um, so when you're making a game, the the honest truth is that 90% of the ideas you come up with uh, are not good, uh, are not right for the game, are not relevant to the game, and end up getting cut, end up getting removed. And uh, if, you're, if your process is well, the majority of that actually happens in the prototyping phase or before the prototyping phase. Um, the reason I really push on brainstorming being this open and safe environment is because to cut, um, to cut away, right? You need something to cut away from. And I think uh, the, the the helpful part of brainstorming as an exercise is that it helps you create this giant cloud of possibility, um, this giant cloud of options. And as you're cutting, you're sort of defining, like, okay, the game is not that. This is not important to the game. This doesn't matter. This is wrong. Um, and that sort of helps you focus on what your game actually is, right? It helps you get to a, a point, a nugget, a core, a truth. Um, but the reality is the overwhelming amount of stuff that you create in a game gets cut again, right? Especially when it comes to uh, mechanics or core stuff. Um, in terms of content, a lot can be reused, even if you change the context of the game. But uh, at heart, um, get used to, to most stuff being cut uh and and going away again i don't think that's a bad thing i think that's a good thing it's only a bad thing if in your process you keep having to cut stuff that you spend weeks or even months on like you should be able to cut stuff much earlier than that um and if you keep running into the problem of cutting um of having to cut stuff that you spent weeks or even months on something is wrong in your process and you need to go back and figure out why that keeps happening um but beyond that, no, cutting is healthy. Cutting is good. Uh, I think in most of of all the game ideas we've had, probably 95% of them never got past the prototype stage. And uh, of the games that we've made, probably 70, 75% of the ideas we've tested uh, ends up in, in on the cutting board. Uh, and that's fine because we test fast, we test dirty. Um, we don't try to make it good. We try to make it fast and uh, i think most game designers you know uh will will have a very similar process come up with lots of ideas test those ideas really quickly um and then throw away all the bad ones um that's that's probably the healthiest way of doing game design okay um mm, i see questions sorted by likes is that correct Hey, no, no, I'm just selecting questions from the pool and pushing them up oh, to you. So, uh, uh, that's really, I think a lot of people have questions for you, Rami, yeah. and <laughs> just trying to ask yeah. them so that we, have, right. we can stay on. Um, let's see. Uh, since the last GDC workshop for you sent waves and questioned the price tag that comes with such workshops during the pandemic, your response was rather quick and resonated with a lot of people. What's your take on open source? Um, that one? Rami, why don't you just check UNA? You'll find the questions getting pushed up to you. It'll be easier for you as okay. well. Uh, uh, I'll just check one. So just check UNA, please. I think it'll be much easier to just go yeah. is that I can't. Uh, that is the top question in my Q&A, though. Oh, okay. Um, it's interesting. Just a minute. Yeah, no, take your time. This is quite an interface. This is a cool interface. I like this. It's quite impressive. Uh, polls discuss. Here. Uh, hi, Rami. Can you explain the third model with an example of a sample game? Um, yeah. Um, so it turns out the question only ex uh, appears on my screen for a second. When you pick a question, so I don't, I don't, I don't get to see what other ones. I just only see for a moment. Um, yeah, actually, um, take ridiculous fishing for example, right? So ridiculous fishing, uh, we're talking about the third model, which is the model with the circle and then the larger circle and the larger circle. And this is actually a, a really fun exercise to go through, um, even in combination with the MDA model, right? So when you look at ridiculous fishing, um, 
on the outer edge was a lot of the marketing and a lot of the the sort of story of ridiculous fishing. A lot of people know about the cloning story. A lot of people know about the story of um, the story of uh, Vlambeer coming back from this clone. Um, we did an ARG that kind of played into corporate versus art, um, and even the title, uh, "Ridiculous Fishing: uh, A Tale of Redemption." Um, of sort of points at that meta narrative. So you've got at the outside, you've got the meta. Um, it has a striking visual style, but that is sort of like inwards toward the aesthetic. And the aesthetic, we needed something that looked striking because we were making, uh, in our mind, uh, what should be the best iOS game ever made, right? So we wanted it to look striking, but we wanted it to look um, accessible. So you'll see soft colors, um, and you'll see that a lot of what we have, um, even though the game is at heart quite violent, um, because you're shooting hundreds of fish with a minigun, um, at heart, um, the game is quite violent, but aesthetically, it is it is quite accessible. Like, yes, there's blood and there's parts of fish, but they are rendered in a, in a pretty um, soft way. The core loop of the game, uh, the mechanics, actually involve you going down, dodging fish, getting deeper and deeper, and then um, catching a fish on the way back up, catching as many fish that you came across as possible. Then when you hit the water line again, they get flung up into the air and you shoot them, right? Um, so the core loop is very simple, and it goes back to what I talked about earlier about positive feedback, is the deeper you get, the more fish you can catch. The more fish you can catch, the more fish you can shoot. The more fish you can shoot, the more money you earn, the more upgrades you can buy so you can get deeper. right? And as you can see, this is infinite positive feedback um, because the upgrades will always help you get deeper. So if those are the mechanics, we need to explain um, if that is the core and the mechanics support that, then the aesthetics have to support that as well. So for a sound design, for example, the musician, Eric Surka, um, I think did incredible work on making sure that the music works both forward and backwards. As you're going down into the water, um, you hear more and more of the song. And then as soon as you hit a fish, the song actually starts rewinding. Uh, it starts playing backwards. And it gives the sense of like going back up. But it also gives the sense of what if I got even deeper, right? Would I hear more? Would there be, would there be more um, music? What would happen? And the same thing with the art, right? The art was done by Greg Woolwind, um, incredible artist. And the same thing happens there. As you get deeper, we put little jokes and little uh, evolutions of the world to, to the sides of the level. Uh, we create jokey fish. It gets darker. There's an upgrade you can buy to, to progress beyond that. That's the skill game. That's the mechanic. Um, and it points back towards positivity, right? Um, every time you played, there had to be a little something that you found uh, especially for the the overwhelming start of the game um but when you start looking at the game like that you can see how everything is pointing back always inwards at either the mechanics or the core and zach gage and Yamilam naiman who were our, our design leads on that game uh, did such a phenomenal job of making sure that, that that was always correct that no matter when i was checking um, the game or the design or the progress or the communication we had to do about it, um, there was never any question that this was the way the design should go. Um, it was a really impressive project to work on. But as an exercise for yourself, pick any game you like, right? Any game you love, and work from the outsides in. Um, what are the mechanics? What are what is the art trying to tell you? What is it guiding you towards? How does that support the mechanics you can see? And how do those mechanics support a core? What do you think the core of your favorite game was? Like if it were one or two sentences, right? What was at the heart of it? What was like the catalyst for that game? I know for um, for some games, uh, one of my favorite shooter games, I know it was actually one gun, the feeling of one specific gun uh that that sort of drove them to make this entire game huge game um but it was the feeling of the weapons that that got them the feeling of movement um every game has a core right every game has one or two sentences that is being built from any good game anyway um so try and see if you can find that for the games you love uh, you'll you'll find that it's a really good exercise another one if we still have time 
What did you use when you got into designing smaller games? Any pointers for a complete newbie for, to programming? Um, well, I'm, I've I've always been a programmer, so for me, uh, the programming tools were not super hard. I ended up using Game Maker. Game Maker is incredibly fast for prototyping. It's simple. It's accessible. Even people that haven't really made games before can can make games in it. Uh, it has a drag and drop interface uh, if you want, uh, but it also supports code. Um, the most common tool I actually suggest for people, um, probably just paper, uh, paper prototyping. Uh, there are things that you can't prototype on paper, but um, Construct, Game Maker, Stencil, um, all of these like entry-level um, engines that are made really to teach people how to uh, program um, are super good super good for this kind of stuff. I really wouldn't worry too much about being a good programmer. Um, you've never seen how bad of a drawer I am, but I am the worst drawer in the world. Uh, like I drew a cow with the head on top of its body because I forgot that a cow's head is in front of its body. Uh, I just wrote the word cow above it and everybody understood what I meant. Um, the same thing is true for code. It doesn't have to be great code. You don't have to program well to make a prototype. No, please program terrible. Uh, the faster it is, the hackier it is, honestly, the better. I saw a team prototype a four-player multiplayer game uh, that you had to play online. And the way they prototyped it is they just rendered it to four monitors and attached four controllers to the same computer. Um and that's how they that's how they prototyped online multiplayer. They didn't even create online or multiplayer. <laughs> it was just on one computer. Uh, it was really fast and it worked really well. They they got the four different perspectives. Um, they got the four different views. They saw how that interacted and completed their playtest, and it was successful. Um, um, that's how prototyping should work. Uh, not not don't try to do it well. Try to do it effective, fast. Um, and if that involves something like a really shitty engine or a really like bad game making tool, who cares? Uh, as long as you can test it. Hey Rami, so we're actually almost at the end of our session time. So uh, before we attend in, attend in one last okay. question, uh, I'm just going to put out a link to a survey. This is for the audience. Uh, guys, this is a link to a Google form. It gives us, we'd appreciate if you could all take a minute to just fill it out. Um, it helps us, you know, make these talks for you every year and we know what, then it helps us know what you also want. All right. So that form is here. Um, I'm going to, it's pasted in the audience chat. I'm just going to look for one last question to push out to you. Uh, there was this one really lovely question, which I see. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to push this one. Okay. Out. How much of your design is reasonably willing to change during execution? Right. Um, almost anything is willing to change during execution, except for the core of the game. If we can't get that, then it's not worth making. But I think the most, the the more important part is how much of a design are you willing to walk away from? And uh, in reality, that is everything. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work right and ideas are conceptual like i said at the start of uh, the start of the talk our brains are really good at filling in blanks right our brains are really good at figuring out like oh okay you know what if we do that and then your brain just kind of goes like oh yeah um this happens a lot with movement mechanics where people imagine movement to be way more enticing um than it actually is 90 percent of the time where you go like oh and then you walk towards the castle and it's like very far away so it's a very long walk and um, it's an idea that every game designer has had, like making people walk towards a very big thing. I don't know why that is such a common idea, but I think everybody has had that idea at some point. And it turns out it's just boring. There's nothing interesting about walking to a thing. If you want to make it interesting, you have to put a lot of stuff there to make it interesting, a lot of things to look at. Um, and when you look at the games that did that well, like Shadow of the Colossus being the prime example that everybody used, well, like it can be done. Um, yeah, but like the walks in Shadow of the Colossus, even to the Giants, were like three to ten minutes, and they used the level design in pretty smart ways to make you feel like you're moving towards different spaces. Like that's the amount of effort it takes to make walking towards something interesting. Is it has to be as interesting a world as that? Um, and it turns out sometimes it turns out that ideas just 
aren't good or aren't interesting and then we walk away from them like the sort of the the implied question here is how much of your designer you're willing to work walk away from in production right when things are already locked down a little um that is more of a producer question that is how much resources do we have how much time do we have how much space can we make and how risky is it to change these things at Flambe, we had a really weird system called metacritic uh we just imagined how many points of metacritic anything would give us and we would go like okay this is 0.6 metacritic so uh, is this worth three weeks of our time and uh, if it three weeks of our time isn't worth 0.6 Metacritic, then we're not going to do it. And it was complete nonsense, obviously, but it was sort of a way for production, um, which was uh, one of my primary tasks, uh, to make sure that we stayed on track, which would be like, hey, is this worth the time we're investing in? When you're in production, it's no longer a question of a pure design. It's always a question of resources, time, money versus, uh, you know, product. Uh, so... It's a completely different discussion, but in essence, uh, we're willing to walk away from anything. Uh, if it doesn't work, doesn't work, try something else. And uh, so sorry, Remy. Uh, speaking of time, uh, unfortunately, I think we are out right now. Uh, so I'm going to have to ask the attendees to hold off their questions. And uh, yeah, guys, uh, big round of applause. Well, big round of applause in the chat for uh, Grammy Ismail. Yeah. Uh, it was very nice of him to have him again as part of the event. Uh, it's been fantastic. And uh, guys, as Shogun has mentioned uh, in the chat, uh, there is a feedback form. Uh, we would really, really like to know what you guys thought of the session. And uh, we are always looking for an excuse to uh, have Rami for a third time. Why not? Yes. Uh, but that's all for now. Uh, so Rami, I could actually ask you to go backstage. There's a, a red button in the top right, right corner. You should be able to we'll see We'll go it. to a uh, So you can go backstage. Yep. Yeah, we'll meet you in a sec. Perfect. Um, can, I, can I say bye real quick? Mm -hmm. Oh, no, absolutely. Um, yeah, for yeah. all of you, thank you so much for being here. Uh, thank you for being a lovely audience. I saw your thumbs up. Uh, really appreciate it. Do fill out the feedback form because it does really help organizers, uh, you know, make better events for you. Right. Uh, if you have any questions that I couldn't answer that we didn't have time for, find me on Twitter, T-H-A underscore Rami. Um, if you have any questions, anything I couldn't answer, I am there for you to answer any questions you have. Uh, if you want a quick phone call with me, there's also ways to do that. There's a pin tweet that allows you to do that. Uh, stay in touch. Let me know what you're working on. I would love to see your projects because normally I'd be there and I'd be able to see your projects. Can't do that right now. Uh, but thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for being such a lovely audience. And uh, I'll see you next time. Bye. Rami, before yeah. you go, we I posted your Twitter handle in the, dis in the discussion. Right. Thank you. And we have a discussion.